Income share agreements can seem like a really good deal when you're looking at a boot camp. They're a way to put off paying until later down the road and you don't end up paying anything unless your income hits a certain threshold. But are they really a cost-effective way to go through a boot camp, to retrain for a new career, to start in a new job? Last week we looked at job guarantees and this week we're digging deeper into income share agreements. There are a variety of options when it comes to paying for boot camps. You can pay up front, which usually comes with a discount. You can defer tuition, which lets you pay after you complete the program with monthly installments and interest similar to a regular student loan. And then some programs also offer an income share agreement. With an income share agreement, you pay a deposit up front and then you don't end up making payments until after you complete the program, a grace period passes, and then you start making a certain amount of money. At that point, you start making payments that vary from program to program as a percentage of your income and usually cap out when you've repaid a certain amount or time out after a certain number of months or years pass. There are some boot camps that offer both job guarantees and income share agreements, but you usually can't combine them. And most of the time a boot camp either offers a job guarantee that's tied to upfront payment or they have an income share agreement as an option because these in some ways are similar marketing tools. With a job guarantee, you pay up front, and then if you meet their criteria, you can get money back later on if you don't get a job that they consider as a qualifying job. Whereas with income share agreements, you don't make any payments at all unless you're making a certain amount of money. As with the video on job guarantees, this video isn't about calling out any single company for their practices. It's to help you make a more informed decision if you're considering a boot camp or other training environment that offers an income share agreement. Is it worth your while? Is it worth considering as a method to pay for it later on and delay the cost? Income share agreements or ISAs vary from program to program, though they usually range from eight to 25% of your income, your gross income, that is before taxes, before you have health insurance or retirement savings taken out, that go back to the company once you start making a certain amount of money. You'll continue making these payments until you hit a total cap on that amount or a certain amount of time has passed. The easiest way to really understand these is to look at some programs. So we're gonna go through a few different examples of income share agreements. These do tend to have a little more variability to them than what the job guarantees do, which we saw last week are very similar to each other. Income share agreements tend to have the same structure, but the amounts on each category tend to vary. Sometimes it's difficult to find really specific information on the income share agreement without speaking to someone in the program or before you sign up for the program, which always is a bit of a red flag to me. If you can't get information without paying, if you can't really understand the terms of what you're being held to, that's an issue. But we can generally find the overall guidelines and then some of the details are not as clear as they should be. We're gonna look at three different programs today. Let's talk about the first program. This program has a one to $2,000 deposit depending on the program that you're going into. Once you complete or leave the program, you have a six month grace period. So regardless of your income, you're not gonna pay anything back in the first six months. This is similar to most student loans where you have three, six, or 12 months before you have to start making payments after you leave the program or complete the program. With program one, the income share agreement kicks in when you're making $40,000 a year, but it actually kicks in when you're making over $3,333.34 a month. So if your month to month income varies, you may find that some months you have to pay and some months you don't have to pay. Any month that you make more than this level, you'll have to pay back 10% of your gross income to the bootcamp program. If you have a month where you make $3,333, you pay nothing, but add that one extra dollar and all of a sudden you're paying $333 per month because you're on the hook for that 10% of your total gross income 
any time that your income for the month passes the threshold of payment. This income share agreement continues for eight years or 48 payments, whichever comes first. So if your income never exceeds that $3,333.34 a month, you'll not end up paying anything for the program other than the deposit that you had to pay up front, that one to $2,000. There's also a cap on payments. So if you stepped into a job right away making $100,000 a year, you're not going to make 48 payments at 10% of that income every single month. Let's be realistic though. You're not going through a data analytics bootcamp, a data science bootcamp, a coding bootcamp, so that you can come out the other end and be making less than $40,000 a year. Part of the reason people go through these programs is to get into a better paying job and a job that has more career opportunity. So the chances of you only paying the deposit are slim to none unless you purposely don't do anything with it for eight years after you finish the program. And the income sharing isn't just tied to a specific role in data science or data analytics or uh, a programmer role, depending on the, the different program that bootcamp that you go through. It's any job that pays that. So if your current job pays more than $40,000 a year, you're still going to be on the hook for the income share agreement for program one. I think bootcamp income share agreements are best visualized when we start looking at different income levels and what they mean in terms of how much you're gonna pay. So let's say you're not the person that never makes more than $40,000 a year, but let's say you just barely hit that. You're making $40,000 a year, the lowest level where you're gonna have to pay something back to the program that you were a part of. In that case, at $40,000 a year, you would make 48 payments that would total up to $16,000. Let's say that you paid $1,000 for your deposit, so your total payment would be $17,000 for the program. Interestingly enough, program one paid in cash up front costs $17,000. At $40,000, you're paying exactly the same as what you would have if you would have paid up front. So that could be beneficial because you can spread the payment over time, but it's not like you're saving any money. They're, the only way that you pay less than that uh, upfront cash tuition amount is if you would not hit the threshold to make payments in all of those payment periods and then only hit the minimum. Um, because you're paying 10% until you hit a specific cap, which we'll talk about in a minute, if you make no payments for, let's say the first seven years, because this is an eight year agreement, let's say you're under 40,000 for the first seven years, but in year eight, you end up getting a job that pays triple, you'll end up still paying 10% of that income. That $17,000 is the minimum you're gonna end up paying if you make the bare minimum above the threshold to start paying. I mentioned there's repayment caps though. In this program, the cap is one and a half times the income share agreement amount. So the income share agreement in this case is for $16,000. The total program 17, we're assuming a thousand dollar deposit, even though we know that varies. And that means your total repayment is 16,000 under the agreement, but you're actually capped at 50% above that. If you hit the cap, you'll end up paying a total of $25,000. That 24,000 for the one and a half times the agreement amount, plus that thousand dollar deposit that you had to make up front when you first got into the program. What does it actually take in terms of income to hit this level? If you make $60,000 a year, you're going to hit the payment cap of $25,000. Anything more, you're still gonna be capped out, so at least you know you won't pay more than $25,000. There could be some variability here. If you don't step into a job that makes that much right away, then maybe you pay somewhere in between the the 17 and the 25, or maybe you pay less than 17. But considering it goes on for 48 payments or eight years or until you hit that cap, chances are high most people are going to end up paying closer to the cap than they are going to be paying just the 
$1,000 deposit. Also keep in mind the pay rate for these types of jobs that you're stepping into. Given the average pay and the typical pay even for entry-level positions in data analytics, data science, and programming, you're more than likely going to be above that $60,000 threshold when you get that first job in the field. So you're probably gonna be closer to the cap than you are going to be to the base. Other programs have a slightly different structure. Let's look at two more programs. For the second program, the second program I looked at is $16,000 if you pay up front, and they require a $250 deposit for the income share agreement option. What this means is you're essentially financing the same amount as you were under the first program. You're financing $15,750 on that income share agreement. So you'll be on the hook to repay that and then an additional adder up to a cap. The second program also goes up to one and a half times the income share amount. It has a base income to start making payments at that same $3,333.34 a month or $40,000 a year equivalent and includes 48 total payments, the one and a half times the income share agreement cap, but I wasn't able to find any timeout. So it wasn't clear to me that like with the first program, if eight years pass, um, then you're done, regardless of how much you've paid. I couldn't find that information for the second program. Maybe it exists, it just wasn't something readily available on their site or that I was able to find through other means. Those two are almost exactly the same, but not every income share agreement is like that. The third program I looked at is a little bit different. They have a 17% repayment rate or income share rate as opposed to the 10% from the first two programs. However, this income share agreement only kicks in over 50,000 a year or $4,167 a month. Under this agreement, you'll make a maximum of 24 payments and the total that you could possibly end up paying back is $30,000. This program has an interesting way of advertising their income share agreement. So rather than say that the income share agreement or the total that you'll pay under the agreement is twice the base tuition, instead they flip it and say that if you pay up front that you'll get a 50% discount. So in this way, they're avoiding talking about this multiplier that's much larger than the other programs where you would cap out at $25,000 roughly on both of the first two programs. In this program, a cash tuition fee would be $15,000 and under the income share agreement, you would cap out at $30,000. So potentially a little more expensive. It has the added benefit of not kicking in until you hit a higher threshold of income, but then it's a lot more of your income every month until you've repaid that total, that $30,000 or you've made 24 months worth of payments. Another unique aspect of this particular program is it's linked to specific job titles that relate to the program. So they have a specific list of job titles that it applies for um, depending on the boot camp that you go through, whether you go through a data analytics, a data science, a coding boot camp, they have specific titles to qualify for this. So that is a slight difference from the first two that really don't care what job you're in, they kick in regardless. There's no question that most people are going to end up spending a lot more using an income share agreement than they are with any of the other payment methods. This doesn't necessarily mean that you should always avoid this though. There could be cases where an income share agreement, especially if it's your only financing option, may be a good decision for you, even if it costs you more in the long run. If you have no potential of saving up the money for paying tuition upfront with these programs, which is going to be your least expensive option, and or it's going to take you so many years to save up that it's just not feasible to practically plan for, or you're looking at it's gonna be five years before I can do this. In those cases, if deferred tuition isn't an option or you know that it's not going to fit in your budget currently, then an income share agreement may be something worth considering. 
you do have to hit the certain threshold to have to make payments so that's nice that could be a benefit um, and it's better than other financing options it's way better to do the income share agreement than to put it on a credit card that might have a 18, 19, even up to 30, 35% interest rate on it. So definitely don't put any of these programs on a credit card unless you're planning to pay it off the same month you put it on the card. Um, but otherwise, I think there normally are gonna be better options. Um, a deferred payment, especially if you know that you can fit those payments into your monthly budget, um, is going to be a better option. If you can pay up front, that's gonna be your least expensive option. Um, so think really hard before you consider this income share agreement as uh, somewhat of a risk-free option for doing a boot camp. You're more likely to benefit from an income share agreement than a job guarantee in that when we looked at job guarantees, you could see it's rare for anyone to actually meet all of the criteria and be granted a refund for the money. Whereas the income share agreement, you only pay when you're making that threshold. And there's structure in place with uh, the agreements you sign and reporting requirements and ways they have of checking your income to make sure that you aren't above the threshold if you're saying that you're not or just that you're reporting your income accurately. So those are some things to keep in mind when you're looking at income share agreements, whether they are from a boot camp, some other training methodology, something else entirely. A few things to keep in mind about how much you might actually end up paying over time if you go for that option. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and please join me next week.